Selling author John Gilstrap. Johnny. Good morning. And uh, Sergeant Bill Kearns, U.S. Marine Corps, and uh, a member of the Health Corps, too, at the Berkeley County Health Department, where he's winding down how many years of service, Bill? Almost 30 years. And Almost 30 years. Yeah. As, as you'd like to say, I'm soon to be a quitter. First step along the ladder of quitting is to retire from your job. Yes. It's nice when you can get there. <laughs> Now you're going to retire, retire, just hang out and be a retiree? No. Well, yeah. You do a lot of co-hosting. Um, do some th- things differently, come in here and co-host yeah. for free. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if you can take the money you make here and invest it wisely. You'll still have nothing. You'll st- yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, uh, he's sitting on a wall full of cash right now, buddy. Well, that's why he's sitting about <laughs> that six, seven inches higher than what yeah. I am over here in the admiral yeah, chair. Is. Our guest in this segment is Sam Petsonk. Uh, Sam, uh, as you uh, have heard him on the program a couple of different times during this election season, has done some political analysis for us and uh, has a, a, a law degree and such to run for office in West Virginia. Sam, good morning. How are you? I'm great, Rob. How are you guys this morning? We are well. Thank you for great. joining us. Sam, I, Thank you. the other day I, I was going over your quote as to what you were thinking might happen with this election. And you couldn't be more incorrect, Sam, to put it bluntly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I could have been more incorrect. I, I, now, let me, d- d- but uh, I, I was definitely not on the mark. No, you weren't. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but we knew that this election could go either way. And uh, I think that, you know, I certainly have some concerns about the outcome, but you know, you you were speaking yesterday about public education. I, I listened yesterday, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, luckily, um, we make different choices as a nation, election to election. But some things remain constant, like public education in West Virginia. That's a core constitutional uh, value. It's a it's a constitutional right in West Virginia. So you know, I always remember. The things that make us who we are don't change election to election. You know, constitutionally, we are still the same West Virginia people, the same American people we've always been, and and we can all take some comfort in that, I think. So I, my question, Sam, is when you were on the program to discuss what may have happened with the presidential election and the down ballot effects in West Virginia, uh, we, are you doing that from a, a genuine spirit of true analysis, or is this your heart is talking more than the actual deductive uh, reasoning might indicate? Because I don't. I, most people didn't <laughs> well, think that West well, Virginia well, was going to lose I, I seats. Guess I should. I, I try to do both. Yeah, I I, I try to do both. Um, you know, Rob, and I think that uh, you know, look the. I don't think anybody saw the extent of the of the wave coming for Trump I, when, before the election. What we could go on is our gut and the polling, and the polling showed that Trump was down uh, ten points from where he had been. I mean, the polling had shown he was closer to sixty percent instead of seventy percent. So my takeaway from that is that, it, based on the numbers historically. West Virginia uh, local candidates typically perform five to ten points closer to one another than the national candidates do. So the deductive reasoning there was if these polls were correct and the Trump and justice were at were at sixty some percent, then the down ballot races should have been closer. So that you know that was going on the best information that that we could have at the time. And of course, the results were a little bit different. From a national perspective, the House and the Senate are still fairly close. But in in West Virginia, the gap has widened even greater. The House of Delegates lost two seats. The Senate lost another seat. It's now 32-2 in the Senate, 91-9 in the House in in West Virginia. Sam, what is the future of the Democratic Party in this state? And, And if indeed it does have a future. Well, you know, I got involved in the Democratic Party a couple years ago because I was frustrated with the Democratic Party. You know, uh, I have watched the Democratic Party privatize workers' compensation, uh, fail to invest in our public education system adequately and equitably uh, over and over for many years. You know, I sued the governor, Governor Tom, when, when he was a Democrat. I I've sued the, uh, Jim Justice when he was a Democrat and when he was a Republican, trying to make these guys do right by our people. So we, uh, I got 
got involved in politics because I think we have a long way to go. And what do we need to do? We need to get better at, frankly, doing what you do on this show, Rob, promoting well-informed public conversation about issues of, of public concern. And uh, we have precious few public forums for this kind of discussion and debate. And the Democratic Party, um, in, nor the Republican Party, has promoted those things historically in West Virginia. I think we have suffered as a state. We've, we've reached these poor public policy outcomes that harm our people because of a lack of uh, good civil discourse. And part of my interest in getting involved in the Democratic Party is to rebuild that party structure, the process for debate and civic engagement at the local level, in the media, and and uh, amongst candidates themselves by recruiting and promoting a robust public debate amongst candidates. And so we did that. We did recruit some superb candidates. We had great candidates, Steve Williams for governor, the three-time mayor of Huntington, you know. We had Glenn Elliott, successful mayor of Wheeling, Teresa Torreseva, the the uh, attorney general candidate, and many more wonderful candidates up and down the ballot, many of whom did win for county commission and, and other offices. And then the goal for all of us over the next decade is to, is to uh, promote well-informed, transparent public conversation about the things that affect us as people. And, and over time, i got to believe that will yield better outcomes. We will reduce poverty. We will improve public education. You know, we will in, improve our infrastructure. Uh, and, and that's what we should all want. So, that, you know, I, I'm hopeful those things will happen in time. In talking to the folks that were running for the offices of Senate, Congress, even governor, uh, this past election, Sam, they all said the Democratic Party at the national level pretty much choked off any money coming into West Virginia. They wrote off the state. So without any financial support from the national Democratic Party and limited fundraising opportunities within the state, it doesn't look promising at this point, does it? Well, I, I, here's the way we get around that problem. First of all, you know, the Democratic Party has to start putting its money where its mouth is on the 50 state strategy. Uh, back in the 2000 and 2004, when you had, uh, Howard Dean and Joe Trippi and Marshall Gans and some really effective strategists running the DNC, they put real money into supporting local organizing all across this country. And it's not, uh, going to consultants and lobbyists. It's going to, uh, staff people to help folks organize house parties and get the message out and talk to one another. It's a good Democratic with a lowercase d uh, Democratic process there, and when we did that, we built back um, uh, you know a strong legislative coalition and enabled uh, President Obama to win the White House in '08. You know that kind of real long-term engagement is what society needs. Forget about what party or or partisan politics you're talking about. You know that's the kind of thing the party has to invest in, and our society really needs that. So that needs to happen. But I want to say at the local level, we are already doing that. We have built back a more active state executive committee. And each member of that state executive committee is expected to give or to raise a regular monthly amount of money to support staffing and core functions to sustain the basic civic work of the Democratic Party. And I've been, that's been a focus of mine. And it doesn't mean we, we, we have a lot of money. But when everybody who cares is involved in this party is giving and supporting that basic civic engagement, over time that yields the results that we really need to see. And so that's what we're working on. And uh, we're not a wealthy party. We're a party of working people, uh, by and large. And, but uh, we're going to make it happen, and it takes time, and it takes sticking together. Uh, Sam, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. You've always been we've talked a number of times and you've always been a very effective cheerleader for the democratic party. And, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the presidential race specifically. Was there a time as I don't know, September went into October and then, and October expired in, into November. Was there a time that you began to sense as far as vice president Harris's campaign was going that you began to sense that she was in trouble? Um, to some degree, uh, you know, I think those numbers, 
uh, in the last few weeks started to look a little cockeyed from from the trajectory that they had been on since July. Uh, so things did begin to take an odd turn. It's it's just hard to guard those numbers, John. You know, it's it's hard to know, but. She continued raising a you know a mind boggling amount of money that's for sure. I mean, you saw those donations, small donors, large donors, everything coming in across the the enthusiasm seemed to be there um and uh you know i I think that she tried to make some pivots there at the end that just didn't work for her. you know the whole gambit with Liz Cheney does not seem to have actually made a difference uh so i think there are some lessons probably there and do you think the mess you said something when when you just talked with rob uh, a minute or so ago about um the democratic party being the party of and I'm, I'm misquoting it but getting to the to the spirit of it being the party of essentially the downtrodden the the, the poor folks and 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 the, and the people who, who need to have help from the government apparently that message got lost in this election and it got lost badly because so many of those groups went for Trump. It went for not only the Republican party, they went for the billionaire. Uh, no, that message did get lost, but I would say the message is not just the party of the downtrodden. We are the party of working people and small business people. And let me explain why West Virginia has the highest health insurance prices in the nation. That is holding back our working people and it's holding back our small businesses. Democrats are the ones who promote reduction in health insurance prices, reduction in these high costs for utilities and health insurance that are the major overhead that holds back expansion of small business and job opportunities for our people. So, yeah, we, you're right. We have to do much better at consistently communicating how we are the ones that have historically and still today enabled working people to do better. And that is our goal. That is who we are. That's when you look at who shows up for Democratic Party meetings. It's labor union members. It's teachers. It's working people. It's small business people who cannot afford to keep their business open with such high health insurance prices. And these are the practical results the Democratic Party has always delivered. And uh, we will continue to do that. <laughs> You're right. It's a challenge uh, because so many people are out there on the other side uh, just really, um, I'd say, lying about who Democrats are. I mean, when you look historically, guys, poverty in West Virginia was at over 50% in 1960. It was Democratic policies. It was the labor union movement and the civil rights movement throughout the 1960s and 70s that reduced poverty in West Virginia by over half. Reagan came in and poverty doubled nearly again, going up to almost 40% by 1990. And then Democrats came in and through reasonable, moderate reforms throughout the 90s, including, um, uh, you know, welfare reform, which was very controversial, but we reduced that poverty rate again. And uh, that's who we are. That's what we're going to keep doing. Bill Kearns. Hey, good morning, Sam. This is Bill. Um, yeah, as John said, you, you've been a great uh, champion and cheerleader for the Democratic Party and and in looking, you know, the numbers really were different um, that you were seeing months before the election and definitely were a swing to Harris's side. But uh, I have to wonder, you know, um, you know, those numbers are just numbers. And and when when the rubber hits the road and people are out there voting, um, are they you know, are they you know, I'm, I'm Democrat, but I, but I, I the economy is number one here. And, and and we and the economy sucks right now, the way it's been for the last four years. Do you think maybe that was a big downfall for Election Day for which what boosted Trump over over the top? majorly um, versus um, having uh, Harris in there. Yes, definitely. I do. That Obviously, elections around the world yielded the same result. People are hurting. I mean, that people cannot pay their basic bills. I mean, you know, I, I'm a practicing lawyer. I've got at least a healthy law practice. I struggle to pay my own doggone electricity bills and things, you know? I mean, it's it, the, the cost of of living is uh, too high. You know, the famous uh, guy from Brooklyn that says the rent is too darn high, you know, that is just real. And people are de feeling desperate and they want change. And now I don't think that we're going to get that type of change from Matt Gates and Donald Trump. Uh, but, you know, 
people need the change and they really deserve the change. So that's what they uh, were voting for the whole world over. For, you the know, Democratic the United States. for the Democratic Party, how are you envisioning changes being made on your all's end to readjust to the current atmosphere that we're going to be going into first of the year? We're staying focused on delivering results for our people. And over the next decade, I want you all to watch county commissioners, uh, Democratic county commissioners, Republican county commissioners all across this state will be cutting ribbons for new broadband projects, new water and sewer, highway projects, downtown development, sidewalks, uh, all sorts of basic infrastructure and, crit- and you know across this state has been bought and paid for by democratic dollars in the in the president biden's infrastructure and inflation reduction laws and those monies will continue to come out over the next decade and we will be reminding our fellow citizens it's democratic policy that is making our communities better stronger stabler and uh and i believe that actually uh, the, the uh, Governor Morrissey will wind up using the tools in the Affordable Care Act to bring down health insurance prices in West Virginia, just like Ralph Yunkin has done in Virginia, to very good effect. And the and even though Morrissey tried to repeal the ACA, uh, dollars to donuts, he's going to use it. He's going to create a reinsurance program, which is authorized and allowed by the ACA. Uh, Morrissey is on record himself advocating for the use of health care reinsurance in West Virginia to reduce premiums. And he's going to do that. And when health insurance prices come down, it's because of of the Democratic Affordable Care Act, that those those policies can take place. And so over time, you know, things will get better, Lord willing, and uh, we'll be here to take credit for it and try to do, <laughs> deliver more. <laughs> Sam Brown Petsonk, our guest here on the program. Sam, uh, how long have you been a resident of West Virginia? Oh, gosh. Uh, off and on, si- uh, si- I would say f- since I came back from college, I came back in, oh, Six. I'm not sure. I actually uh, was uh, in the AmeriCorps program down in Mullins, and so I've been. And I, I went and worked for Senator Byrd, so I've been in and out of West Virginia uh, a few times since then. But I've lived and worked here uh, off and on since uh, since I came back from college. You know, I went to work for Senator Byrd for about three years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've seen things that's, you know, over what is that now, 15 some odd years uh, since I've been out of school and working out of college and working in West Virginia. It, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we've seen some harder times. You can see the, the amount of people leaving West Virginia. I'm sort of a get bucking the trend. I came back after school, and um, unfortunately, over the last 15 years, I think we've had about an average of 20,000 people per year leaving West Virginia. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, a problem. Hey, we've got to reverse that trend. I've, for my part, I'm, I've tried to do that and build a career here. So my question to you is, based on your experience living in West Virginia, and I've worked in West Virginia 34 years, the state takes in $20 billion roughly in revenue, $5 billion is generated by the state. $15 billion comes from the federal government in various ways. So 75% of this state's economy is federal government, yet the state overwhelmingly rejects the federal government and wants a lot of the strings tied to the federal government cut and separated. It is an enigma because if the federal government tomorrow pulled all of its money out of West Virginia, the state would cease to exist. Can you explain the, re- the, the overwhelming rejection of the federal government by West Virginia residents despite the amount of dollars that flow into this state? I think it's not a substantive rejection of those dollars because when Republicans come into control in West Virginia, those dollars never go away. They never vote against. I mean, you know, some of these House members lately have voted against them, um, but that, that those votes never made a difference. They never actually reduced the amount of federal investment in West Virginia. It's all political posturing, and I think there's something real. Here's the real feeling behind that. Okay, we want our economy to compete on an equal footing with other states. We know, like I mentioned, our state was incredibly poor, remains one of the poorest states in the country, but you know. 
know, it was it was by and large federal investment that brought down the poverty rate here and gave us a middle class in West Virginia. That is that is what how we have a middle class in West Virginia instead of a 55 percent poverty rate. And people want to get, and should want to get beyond that. And, you know, it, it, the, the fact is, uh, that is a hard thing to do. And you're right, in some counties, transfer payments make up, you know, yeah, nearly three quarters of all personal income. I mean, it's it, it, now, th- my belief is that you, the way to do that, the way to become less dependent on transfer payments, federal transfer payments, is to bring younger people, to give younger people a reason to want to live here and work here. And, you know, uh, clearly sending messages of rejection, division, and hate over the last decade uh, has led more people to leave West Virginia uh, than ever before. We had, we had an average population loss of about 2,000 people a year from 1950 until 2014. 2,000 people a year on average left West Virginia. Over the subsequent 15 years since, or 10 years since uh, 2014, since Republicans started setting social policies that divide people in West Virginia, that rate has increased tenfold. We are now losing 20,000 people a year. So the way we get past reliance on federal programs and an aging population that, that relies on Social Security is we promote a more open society that helps people succeed as entrepreneurs and raise a family and live in a, you know, in a productive fashion. That's my two cents about it. I have two minutes left, John. Do you have a final question or point to make? Now, it just, it just now occurred to me, um, when you're talking about these various infrastructure programs, when uh, Senator Manchin stepped away, there's nobody to take ownership of those. If, there had, if he had stayed in, in the race with all of these infrastructure programs that are going on, and they all have that sign that's out there that this is a result, of, that these, these projects are a result of the infrastructure program, those were each individual photo ops that he could have had with an accompanying speech. But with him out, there's nobody to take that. There's nobody to- the victory ass- lap? Yeah, there's nobody can take the victory lap. And with Justice in the race, he took up all the oxygen in the room. And 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 no Democrat's going to come up and say, yeah, I want to spend another trillion dollars. It's It was an opportunity two, two lost. Two things. Two things. First of all, we've got county commissioners all over this state who are going to remind people about those results. If they're listening today, I want these county commissioners to say, the reason you are succeeding in your job is because of these federal Democratic dollars. We need to remind people about that, because that's how our counties operate, and that's how they'll thrive over the next decade. But also, Shelley Moore Capito and and Jim Justice are going to be there for every ribbon cutting, and they will defend those programs. I guarantee it, because I've watched you. I have immense respect for Shelley Moore Capito. She's a very intelligent intelligent person. She's been an effective congresswoman and senator, and she's been there for every ribbon cutting since the uh, Recovery Act in 08, and she will continue to be, and she should be. So I, I'm, I'm confident, like I say, the party labels change, but who we are as a people, constitutionally what we value and what we really need, what we can, will not compromise on, those things don't change. And, and uh, we've got to keep talking about it, keep making good decisions as a people, and then, like say, guys, keep it up, because Lord willing, things will get better over time they always have by and large sam thanks for your appearance today much appreciated likewise rob thank you all good talking to you sam brown pet song at uh, nine o'clock